dear guests, dear colleagues. I am happy to greet everyone. Today we have an opportunity to uh, meet an excellent uh, researcher, uh, expert, our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Elkan Nuriev. He is a Pink Visegrad uh, research fellow at IFET, our institute. And uh, at the same time, uh, he is a senior expert on uh, Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia uh, at uh, L and M Political Risk and Strategy Advisory uh, in Vienna. Uh, our topic today is the EU Russia China Triangle post COVID 19 uh, scenarios in the Eastern Partnership. Uh, region. And uh, as you know, uh, Eastern Partnership uh, region is a uh, hotly contested region uh, where uh, EU, Russia, and China have different approaches to a regional uh, integration. And these differences uh, have an impact on uh, the six Eastern Partnership countries. Uh, Elkan Nuria will discuss uh, whether uh, regional integration uh, projects can create a win-win situation uh, for the region uh, and uh, give an opportunity to develop the region uh, or we will establish a zone of competing uh, economic and political influences. And also uh, the speaker will be explaining how and uh, why the political and economic uh, impact of a COVID-19 uh, pandemic in a post-Soviet uh, Eurasia will uh, highlight even more pressing role of Moscow, uh, Beijing and Brussels uh, can play in the region. Uh, I must mention that my excellent colleague uh, taking part uh, in our uh, conversation today uh, as a discussant, uh, Victor Esterhoi, who specializes in geopolitics in addition to his research on China and uh, about a uh, structure of today's conversation in a few words. So first, uh, our guest will give a presentation in about uh, 40 minutes. Uh, after that, my colleague will comment uh, on today's topic and we will ask his questions in about 15 minutes. Finally, we will uh, open a Q&A session to engage our guests and partners in this dialogue. Uh, all participants, guests are kindly requested to enter their questions during the presentation using the Q&A Zoom feature. Uh, and as usual, we spent a little uh, over an hour on today's event. Uh, so with this, uh, dear Khan Nuriev, the floor is yours. Well, um, first of all, thank you uh, for inviting me here. Uh, to speak uh, today at this online event organized by the Institute for Foreign Affairs and uh, Trade in Budapest. I'm uh, really delighted to share my ideas and concerns and views, of course, with all of you. And I hope uh, uh, to have an interesting discussion after, after my presentation. Well, uh, uh, do you hear me? Everything is fine, yeah? Okay. Uh, so uh, speaking about the EU-Russia-China triangle in the Eastern Partnership region, I will focus uh, on the present shape uh, of the triangular relationship between the European Union, Russia, and uh, China. 
and uh, its strategic uh, implications for their region-wide security architecture. Uh, uh, I will also provide uh, an overview of uh, recent developments uh, and different perspectives uh, in the context of major uh, regional integration uh, projects uh, such as Russia-led uh, Eurasian Economic Union, uh, the European Union's Eastern Partnership Initiative and uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, BRI. And uh, I will conclude uh, with uh, presenting my ideas uh, on what may lie ahead, uh, especially in the post-COVID-19 era and uh, will suggest uh, possible ways uh, uh, in which the European Union, uh, Russia and China could facilitate uh, cooperative uh, efforts aimed at helping the Eastern Partnership uh, countries uh, foster greater stability and lasting peace in the entire, entire region. Well, uh, although uh, Eurasian Economic Union uh, Eastern Partnership and BRI are at various phases of their implementation, each one of them seems to entail uh, bigger geopolitical visions uh, promoting uh, competing uh, ideas of uh, regionalisms. As these regionalist integration projects are currently evolving in Eurasia, the post-Soviet states are actually straddling fault lines and uh, choosing sides in the entire region. And uh, many important uh, challenges uh, facing smaller regional uh, countries have actually put them at the juncture of uh, those potential faults. And this is especially true for the Eastern Partnership uh, countries, which still uh, remain uh, to varying degrees uh, unstable, unreformed, and embroiled uh, in uh, conflicts. Uh, I think uh, for Russia, uh, China's uh, BRI um, is less of a threat uh, than an opportunity. Uh, Moscow is uh, receptive to the BRI's ability to help uh, create a multipolar world as it uh, bolsters uh, China's uh, global stance uh, to counterbalance American hegemony. And uh, the Kremlin uh, also views the BRI as a means to attract Chinese investment and foster renewed uh, Russian influence over the European Union's Eastern zone. Uh, of course, one of the important uh, buckles of the Silk Road economic belt the overland or, or component of China's BRI is the Eastern Partnership region, which represents an essential link between Asia and uh, Europe. Uh, developing this uh, stage uh, means enhancing uh, commercial relations uh, with six partner countries uh, and an infusion uh, of investment funds in several emerging market economies. But it's also a contested uh, neighborhood where China, Russia, and uh, the European Union have uh, different uh, approaches to the dynamics of uh, regional integration. Uh, amid the current uh, intricacies of the China-Russia-EU triangle, these uh, differences have an impact on, on the post-Soviet uh, states, which, uh, have taken, uh, which have taken an advantage of uh, the opportunities that uh, several cooperation uh, initiatives offer today. 
limited uh, involvement uh, and selective management, uh, selective engagement with uh, with a Moscow-driven Eurasian Economic Union, uh, the Brussels-led Eastern Partnership uh, Initiative, and the Beijing-sponsored BRI, uh, have actually enabled incumbent regional leaders to um, balance the ambitions of Russia, the EU, and uh, China, and of course, to reduce uh, external influences to a minimum by playing uh, them off against each other. But even if the Chinese presence uh, remains modest uh, compared with that of Russia and uh, the EU, Beijing's model of integration uh, based on uh, its intense promotion of the BRI, uh, complete with big promises uh, to invest in many different uh, sectors, actually serves uh, as a vehicle of China's economic uh, expansion, which is uh, helping, indeed helping uh, the Eastern Partnership countries, uh, first of all, self-position themselves in the wider geopolitical context, and then improve uh, their infrastructure and boost uh, their involvement in global, in global trade. Uh, the BRI uh, is increase, increasingly perceived uh, in uh, wider geopolitical terms, especially when uh, considering that China's flagship project promotes a new Eurasian ge geoeconomic uh, order aimed at uh, integrating uh, participating countries. Examining Russia's and uh, the European Union's perspectives on the BRI and its outlook uh, in their shared neighborhood, of course, is of greater interest here. In effect, uh, China's increased economic involvement in the Eastern Partnership region is strongly connected uh, to Beijing relations with Moscow. China is somewhat uh, ambivalent towards the regionalization of emerging market economies and at times uh, unable to foster uh, stronger regional ties uh, because its pure economic uh, power is still not uh, sufficient. Uh, but one possible, uh, one, one possible uh, explanation for this lack of uh, affinity may be that uh, there is a, a civilizational uh, difference and a civilizational difference of a culture, cultural barrier uh, between China, uh, which doesn't have uh, any clear strategic intentions in the post-Soviet territory and uh, the European Union's uh, Eastern uh, neighborhood. By contrast, uh, Eastern partnership leaders, uh, at least some of them, uh, and Russian counterparts have certain ingrained uh, affinities not least that they were educated during uh, Soviet times. Well, they speak uh, a common lingua franca and uh, have close uh, personal ties and uh, share a similar understanding of the geopolitics of the region, not to mention uh, Russia's uh, centuries old influence over the economics, politics, and uh, security of the, uh, of the area. 
a few words about uh, convergence of interests uh, between uh, between China and uh, Russia. Without doubt, uh, China Russia relations are crucial to understanding the nature of uh, their impact on regional cooperation. And uh, at present, uh, there is a profitable uh, convergence of strategic China uh, Russian interests. China seems to have uh, implicitly recognized uh, uh, Russia's privileged. Uh, position in post-Soviet uh, Eurasia. In response, uh, Russia has appreciated the BRI's positive potential and is uh, actually adopting uh, a conciliatory approach to China's, uh, uh, to, uh, to China's vigorous push in the European Union's Eastern Partnership region particularly following Western sanctions, which led Moscow to depend more on Beijing. Uh, this is, uh, however, uh, I think more due to strategic uh, compulsions uh, than a con conscious uh, choice. For Russia, in my opinion, the BRI is conducive uh, to the creation of, of a multipolar world as it uh, bolsters, as I already said, China's global stance to counterbalance American uh, influence and uh, hegemony. Uh, Russia uh, also clearly views the BRI as a means to attract uh, Chinese uh, investment in its economy, and perhaps more critically, as a source of uh, significant uh, transit revenues uh, from trans-Eurasian trans rail uh, freight. Uh, simultaneously, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union and the BRI uh, appear more uh, complementary than mutually exclusive. A major goal uh, of the BRI is uh, to merge with, uh, with the Putin's uh, Eurasian Economic Union, which gives uh, Russia a competitive uh, advantage in trans-Eurasian land transit because uh, freight uh, traversing the Eurasian Economic Union uh, must pass uh, customs only once between China and the EU. And uh, to take a great advantage uh, of uh, trans-Eurasian uh, freight, uh, routes under the BRI. Uh, Russia, of course, uh, supports efforts uh, towards regulatory convergence and soft uh, infrastructure development in, uh, in Eurasia. But Moscow also working on uh, working to promote uh, coordination between uh, multilateral institutions uh, to make available a stable long-term uh, financing for the BRI's uh, capital uh, intensive components. However, uh, I think uh, the implementation of the Eurasian Economic Union and the BRI could uh, trigger uh, future geoeconomic and geopolitical competition between Moscow and uh, Beijing. Uh, regarding Brussels and uh, Eastern Partnership opportunity, uh, well, uh, for its part, uh, the European Union views the BRI in its Eastern neighborhood neither negatively nor uh, unconditionally positively. 
the BRI's uh, two economic corridors in Central Asia and the South Caucasus uh, complement uh, Brussels' vision of trans-Eurasian uh, connectivity, though they are not coordinated with the European Union. Uh, while highlighting uh, opportunities and uh, challenges uh, for the European transport uh, system, uh, Brussels also emphasizes uh, the weaknesses of these uh, corridors, arguing that the new Eurasian uh, land bridge is um, economically feasible, but uh, geopolitically hazardous in the context of the current alienation and uh, rivalry uh, between the EU and uh, Russia. Uh, the China Central Asia West Asia economic corridor on the one hand uh, is more expensive but uh, geopolitically safe. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, both corridors account for a tiny share of total EU-China trade. Uh, but if we look at uh, uh, China's uh, geopolitics, uh, oh, sorry, some, some technical problems. Uh, Yeah, setup is complete. I have some on my computer. Okay. Well, uh, uh, if uh, if if we talk about uh, China's uh, geopolitics, uh, I mean in the in the Eastern Partnership region, I would say that. Uh, China may, may enter into competition with the EU uh, for access to Caspian, to Caspian Sea air uh, energy resources. And uh, from my point of view, uh, uh, this is especially uh, relevant uh, and uh, particularly important uh, today, uh, after the end uh, of uh, the 44 day uh, war in Karabakh, during which Azerbaijan uh, liberated uh, several districts, cities, and settlements that were occupied by Armenia for almost, uh, for almost 30 years. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the form. Uh, this is about the formation of a new uh, geopolitical reality, under which I think new economic, business, and investment projects uh, uh, can be uh, considered by international companies and uh, various countries. Uh, Chinese companies, in this context, Chinese companies may be interested in buying uh, Azerbaijani gas uh, within the BRI if, and uh, of course it's a big if, and an agreement on laying uh, a Trans-Caspian gas pipeline is concluded between uh, Turkmenistan and uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, the BRI uh, may thus bring economic growth and help uh, consolidate uh, uh, the region's uh, stability. But this will occur only if uh, BRI-related projects do not undermine uh, implementation of sustainable reforms uh, in the six participating countries, which the European Union uh, promotes through its uh, Eastern Partnership uh, policy. 
uh, the European Union could also respond uh, by crafting a new model of protective integration. And I think for this purpose, uh, uh, Brussels should uh, strongly support uh, the creation of uh, a new business and trade uh, alliance. It's about a unique network of enterprises in the Eastern Partnership region, uh, aiming to make regional trade uh, and uh, connectivity simpler and better. Uh, this implies uh, that Eastern European companies should be given uh, proper representation in the European Union business circles in order to promote uh, their project ideas uh, in the fields of industry, uh, energy, and uh, trade. By the way, at the initial stage, uh, this could be done, could be well done, uh, in the context of economic and trade cooperation between Eastern Partnership States and uh, the Visegrad uh, group, uh, Visegrad group countries. Well, uh, obviously, uh, China's geopolitical status is rapidly changing. And uh, this is becoming particularly relevant today because uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis has accelerated the US-China uh, strategic rivalry and the prospect of new sanctions uh, hangs over China. Uh, Beijing's growing influence in Eurasia, uh, I think, has the potential to create new economic uh, new geo-economic divides, especially as the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has further stirred anti-China sentiments that had already taken root in uh, most of Western, uh, Western countries. Uh, even so, uh, I think China uh, has benefited from the current crisis by exploiting uh, the lack of cohesion and uh, erratic foreign policy among key European powers. And Beijing has used an opportunity uh, to strengthen its reputation in the Eastern Partnership countries by providing uh, medical material and expertise in dealing with the uh, COVID-19 coronavirus. EU member states, meanwhile, have not uh, coordinated with each other uh, to craft achievable uh, policy goals, uh, policy uh, goals uh, which uh, while Russia and China are strengthen, uh, strengthening their strategic cooperation, putting forward uh, joint narratives and moving close, closer to creating their own Eurasian security uh, alliance to compete with the West. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, well, uh, in conclusion, a couple of uh, a couple of words uh, on what could be the path to trilateral path to the trilateral uh, trilateral cooperation. Well, uh, mm, Brussels, uh, Moscow, and Beijing, I think, need to devise a coherent strategic plan that uh, focuses on an integrated, consistent approach 
and uh, recognizes the shared interests of uh, Russia, the European Union, uh, China, and uh, the Eastern Partnership uh, countries. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, has actually created a new landscape of uh, potential uh, geopolitical risks to the Eastern neighbors, which are likely to be further sidelined, uh, especially now when uh, the European Union strives to develop a coordinated uh, position internally and externally, in addition to uh, unsuccessful efforts uh, to uphold the United stance on Russia. Therefore, uh, the political and economic impact of COVID-19 in the Eastern Partnership uh, region, I think will highlight uh, even more pressing rules. Russia, the European Union and China can play uh, in promoting competing regionalist uh, paths in the context of new unfolding geopolitical uh, realities. Well, uh, as uh, geopolitical talk of uh, war hits up in the uh, so-called common neighborhood, uh, the Eastern partners will uh, remain isolated regardless of uh, whether a particular country chooses these or that economic integrative uh, project. Uh, I think the failure of the European Union to get more proactive uh, in the Eastern Partnership affairs clearly demonstrates its inability to build international support uh, around interests that are in competition with uh, Russian ones. For many post-Soviet states, uh, however, uh, I would say there is no economic promise on the side of uh, Russia, which cannot offer, at least, at least at present, cannot offer anything but regional hegemony over its neighbors uh, because her economy doesn't perform well enough for it to be attractive uh, for closer economic uh, integration. Uh, paradoxically, uh, some policymakers and even politicians uh, have recently argued uh, for neo-containment, implying a commitment to a new strategy of containment for Russia as a carefully calibrated response to Russian uh, strategic challenge. I think uh, in the post-COVID-19 world, however, Russia may easily turn into an unsatisfied revisionist power uh, seeking to regulate pan-European security among other things. And uh, if the European uh, Union continues to contain Russia or if Moscow retries to uh, rebuild an exclusive sphere of influence in the near abroad, uh, of course, a course of competition, uh, if not a confrontation, uh, will last decades and may eventually put all regional integration initiatives in jeopardy. So uh, the strategic choices uh, that the European Union and Russia make today, and particularly how they will act in the near future to bridge potential fault lines will not only shape the contours of the emerging regional order, but will also determine whether post-Soviet 
countries, I mean Eastern partnership states, Europeanize or, or stagnate. Uh, I think the solution to reconciling the European Union and uh, the U Eurasian Economic Union and hence uh, breaking the isolation of the Eastern partnership countries would be to establish there in uh, free economic zones or free trade zones commercially accessible to either blocks liberating Eastern uh, partners from the painful consequences of their uh, dilemma. Uh, concurrently, uh, China's uh, geopolitical status, as already mentioned, is rapidly uh, changing and uh, uh, Beijing's uh, growing influence in Europe has uh, the potential to create new economic device. And I think uh, uh, it's, it's still unclear how the set of uh, the BRI related projects will be interconnected as they depend mainly on expanding political relations with various Eastern partnership uh, states pursuing uh, different foreign policy goals. So a key question hinges upon how Beijing will use uh, political leverage gained through its BRI. Uh, but I think uh, despite, its, uh, despite these uncer uncertainties, uh, uncertainties, uh, actually, uh, Chinese investment uh, drive will uh, remain eye catching uh, to the Eastern partnership uh, countries uh, because the BRI has the potential to significantly contribute to regional economic uh, development. Uh, in my opinion, uh, still, uh, competing regionalism uh, can be transformed into cooperative regionalism. Uh, the EU-Russia-China triangle may ultimately benefit from regional integration activities if uh, Brussels, Moscow and uh, Beijing can re-engage partner countries by choosing positive sum strategy rather than a negative sum game. And uh, this entails that the success of cooperative regionalism is linked to the ability of the of three powerful actors, Russia, China, and the EU, to redefine their relationship in a more constructive uh, sense. And uh, perhaps most important, I think uh, the European Union, Russia and China should uh, think strategically uh, about working out uh, a new cooperative relationship formed with an, an agreed multilateral framework of rules that would foster a system aimed at imposing responsibility and uh, restraints on Moscow, Beijing, and Brussels. And uh, their capacity for constructive uh, cooperation will determine whether the Eastern partnership countries make uh, tangible progress of, uh, on peace building, sustainable development, and uh, successful integration into the global economy. Let me stop here and uh, I look, I'm looking forward to uh, interesting discussion with the audience. Thank you very much.
Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Victor, please share your views on the topic and ask your question. Uh, thank you, Jörn. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I would like to thank to Dr. Erhan Nuriyev this very comprehensive and thought-provoking presentation, I have to say. Uh, I fully agree as well that the possible triangle of cooperation between China, Russia, and the EU is, is no doubt the hottest topic in our days, uh, European politics. And Eurasia, or uh, Eurasia as a concept, or, or the unification of Eurasia, however, is not necessarily a new thing. Uh, of course, those who are familiar with geopolitics, one of the classics of geopolitical tradition uh, defines the possible consequences of the unification of Eurasia for the, for the global efforts and, and also for the global uh, politics. Uh, one of the most well-known uh, concepts related to Halford Mackinder, who was arguing that if Europe, Asia, and also Africa in his concept uh, can be united in somehow, this would integrate so much of the capacities of the global possibilities on the world that this necessary would make this great power who, who can manage the unification of this, this huge mega region uh, as the most dominant uh, actor in the global politics. On the other hand, this would also provide an opportunity for, for this great power to challenge the historical dominance of, of maritime or, or sea powers, uh, especially concentrated in the West, like the UK and later the United States. So, so I would say uh, this concept is, uh, as, this is not necessarily new and, and how Eurasia can be, can be rise was proved uh, by uh, the Soviet Union, who, or which, which country became uh, a challenger of the United States in the second part of the uh, second, uh, in, in the 20th century. So, so this is not necessary, a uh, new thing to talk about uh, Eurasia, but it's obvious that after the Cold War uh, and uh, and uh, the loss of uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, it was proved that the original concept, how Mackinder thought about Eurasia, uh, was, was at, to, to integrate Eurasia via uh, railways is not enough to simply challenge uh, the maritime superpower of the United States. So the concept of Eurasia became a kind of a taboo uh, in, in most of the uh, academic circles and also in, in, in politics. Uh, only in Russia, <laughs> this concept still remained in a, I would say, in a very covert form. This was also shared with, with some of the top scholars also uh, in Russia. And, and we can also prove it that this concept uh, had a positive element, not just a negative as in the West. Uh, we, uh, so this this had a this has a positive side of this concept and was used in the Eurasia Economic uh, uh, Economic Union. So this was this this praise Eurasia was was, uh, was this concept was praised uh, in order to to boost a further cooperation uh, between uh, Central Asia and, uh, and 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 Russia. However, uh, in the West. Uh, most of the uh, great powers did not put so much emphasis on, on uh, Eurasia Economic Union. So it was simply, uh, simply threat. They were simply thought that this is something like a kind of a concept to, to rebuild the Soviet Union. So, so nothing new, uh, challenging uh, concept is, is, is rising from Russia. I would also agree that the, the major change in the landscape or what I would say the Eurasian landscape uh, was, was the ch rise of China and the Belt and Road Initiative as, as a concept. So China became a challenger, no doubt, for the United States. And then at the same time, it is also providing something, something a, new, a new concept. Uh, and this enforced uh, other actors to, to, to react. And this is very interesting because when this, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative was, was, uh, was first mentioned uh, by President Xi in 2013, uh, those China watchers uh, were, were thinking of whether we really have to deal with the battery of the initiative. This is a really irrelevant concept to, to think about. And do we need to do anything with this? Because this is a beautiful brand, uh, includes all, most of the foreign projects of China. So, so do we really have to deal with the content of the battery of the initiative? And eight years passed. And I have to say, 
all the major actors have to somehow react to the Belt Road Initiative. So this is something really as a kind of a new turning point, uh, at least in, in, in this region. Uh, the Eurasia Economic Corridor, well, uh, sorry, the Eurasia Economic Union uh, was revived as a kind of a cooperation or, or, a, or a complementary form of the Belt Road Initiative. So from this point of view, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union is not just as a concept to, to rebuild uh, the Soviet Union, but somehow uh, uh, can be seen as a complementary element of, of the Belt Road Initiative. And from this point of view, this, this proves that China and Russia can somehow cooperate with each other. So this is something which completely changes the environment also for the European Union. That's a surprise. The EU also had to find a kind of a response. Uh, and many, sir, many circles within the European Union has already started to flirt with this idea to, to do something in Eurasia. And this had a very big impact also in, in Hungary as well. Uh, we have now Eura Eurasia Forum. We also have Eurasia uh, think tanks, dedicated journals on Eurasia. And even the prime minister several times mentioned Eurasia as a, as a possible concept for Europe to, to find partners uh, in the East and somehow to change the geopolitical direction of, of the country. Uh, but somehow I, 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 I agree also with, with, with the presenter that uh, this classical geopolitical sense, how we think about the unification of, of Eurasia is outdated in, in our days. So due to globalization, uh, we don't really talk about the control over the strategically important era as a used for military influence of other regions, but we entered into a geoeconomics or age of geoeconomics. And here, the more emphasis is put on, on connectivity. So I, I also agree with the presenter that this kind of unification is, 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 is not as it used to be, because, because now what really matters is connectivity. And just to prove it, uh, the EU, uh, also launched this uh, connectivity strategy, the global gateway uh, concept a few weeks ago. So this proves quite well that how unification of Eurasia is, 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 uh, is emerging in, in the age of uh, geoeconomics is some, somehow challenging the original concept of, of, of for example, Halford Mackinder's Eurasia, which mostly based on, on, on military control and, and controlling the strategically important military control in the strategically important uh, regions of, of Eurasia. So I, 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 I very much agree with the presenter that, that the major aim of the academy is now to, to try to, to grab how, the, how these diver, different uh, uh, concepts, how these different connectivity strategies are, are, are complementing each other. Because that's that's a very interesting issue, uh, because this great power uh, competition, as we what we are familiar with, or which are very much uh, understood by the the by the academic community, is already went through a transformation. So in my in my in my in my very short uh, comment or, or as a discussant, I would like to uh, ask or, uh, or or say few for very minor comments and also all of them has a has a question part as well so you mentioned also the a great power competition uh, but but how, how should we how should we understand this kind of great power competition in the age of geoeconomics so can you can you grab with a very uh, clear definition uh, how, how, how we should see the difference? Of this kind of great power competition in the age of uh, geoeconomics, uh, and and of course, if we are focusing on the competition, what is the cooperation element of this? You you, you mentioned that you, you truly believe that uh, it is possible uh, for for great powers to find a regional cooperation uh, form, but how can you define uh, this concept? So, what could be the true element of of this kind of uh, of, of cooperation? So I really like this, this, this idea, the cooperative regionalism you mentioned, but what are the key features uh, of this? Because I think that's the most relevant to understand how these great powers uh, in Eurasia can, can further unite, or what are the major challenges uh, for these great powers? Uh, second, I, 
I missed one point from your presentation, and maybe this could be interesting for you as well to discuss, that in the age of geoeconomics, uh, one thing is sure that beside the states and beside the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, anybody can be an actor. So uh, companies, no doubt, think tanks, uh, culture institutions, uh, even, even scholars uh, can, be, can, be, uh, can be the actors of connectivity. Uh, what do you think? What could be the impact of these independent or half independent actors uh, on, 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 on grant strategies? Because it is clear that great powers have, have connectivity strategies, but how these, uh, how these actors are actually formulating uh, the outcome of, of these kind of uh, grant strategies? So what could be their impact on, on the unification or, or the complementary element of, of these connectivity uh, strategies? Uh, my first question is, 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 of course, necessarily touching the United States. So uh, the United States seems to be the obvious loser in the unification of Eurasia. And no doubt that, as I mentioned, Eurasia was a taboo, especially in the United States for, uh, for, for decades. Uh, but, but can the United States really stop this process? So is it, is it possible to launch a, a counter a connectivity strategy? Uh, or the only way to, 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 to compete with, with China or, or with Eurasia is, is something like a new Cold War. And so I, I would highly, I, I would really would like to see your opinion regarding this because, because many, many in Hungary and also in the West are arguing that we are entering to a new Cold War. And that's a kind of a mistake to see that connectivity is the most important feature of our our, our age is because, because what we are doing is actually to nothing, nothing new, just we are simply stepping back into a new form of, uh, of, of a Cold War. And if this is true, can the European Union win a, win a, win a new Cold War? So that would be the, my first uh, question and, and the first topic I would like to touch. Uh, and last but not least, in your presentation, you mostly uh, talked about great powers. So my question is that uh, what what should uh, smaller countries uh, do? Like, like you mentioned, Eastern neighbors countries, and, and also this is uh, this is question is also relevant for Hungary. Uh, I expect that you will say something like uh, we should follow uh, a multi-vector foreign policy, uh, but but is it really possible? So, if if great powers are pushing these small countries, is it is it really possible to avoid choosing a side and and to to grab the gains of being part of different connectivities? So these would be my four uh, issues I would like to raise and also a kind of questions and I would like to pass back the floor to you uh, to react on them. Of course, you don't necessarily have to <laughs> have to give an answer for all my uh, questions you raised, but uh, probably this could be an interesting issue for you to, to think it over. So I, I would like to uh, pass on the floor to you, uh, Alkan. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Victor, for uh, interesting questions you raised. Uh, yeah, uh, I, let me let me unite all of them and uh, give you. Uh, uh, I, I will try to give an, a compre comprehensive answer to all of these questions. Uh, I will start with the last question. Uh, I think what's currently happening in uh, West Russia relations is not a new Cold War. Many, many consider it a Cold War, new Cold War. Uh, I disagree. Mm, I think it's, uh, you know, it's not even a renewed uh, East-West divide. Uh, I think we are talking here about a grand uh, high stakes uh, geopolitical game uh, that has been fueled by decades of mutual mistrust and uh, competing interests of uh, great powers. Uh, to me, actually, uh, the current international uh, situation reminds one of a chess game in which uh, kings, queens, and I'm very sorry, pounds are moved uh, 
uh, with an illusion of an absent opponent, neglect uh, for these possible moves and an awareness of uh, potential positions of the opposing chess pieces. Uh, but uh, yet in this game, uh, the chessboard is a very real battlefield uh, with such hotspots challenging global secu security uh, as, for example, Syria, uh, Afghanistan, uh, North Korea, and other modern uh, pivot uh, states. And the ability to, uh, to see the entire battleground is therefore crucial, crucial to everyone, to every player. Uh, meanwhile, uh, as the two positions of the rival players on the Eurasian chessboard are unknown, I think unknown to Western decision, decision makers. They are just moving chess pieces around without knowing how to take the king. <laughs> so that is precisely why the United States, uh, NATO and the European Union often move their pieces down the flanks of the grand chessboard to avoid the center uh, where the positions are uh, more actually vulnerable. Uh, Russia in turn not only sees where major players are on the grand chessboard, it also sees uh, the entire geopolitical uh, battleground with uh, great clarity uh, around the clock, real time, and in all types of uh, situations. And uh, since Putin, Mr. Putin comprehends uh, the global lineup of uh, forces with that kind of uh, lucidity, and uh, his uh, Western op opponents do not actually. Uh, Russia enjoys an advantageous position uh, that can uh, actually determine its uh, victory. Uh, so, uh, to me, it's uh, it's not it's not it's no coincidence uh, that the Kremlin leader that the Kremlin leader makes uh, moves with uh, masterful skill, going after the West's strategic centers of gravity, gravity with much more efficiency, uh, perhaps more than any other leader, uh, Mr. Putin by virtue of his long time Soviet intelligence experience understands how Western uh, democracies operate in the, uh, in the contemporary world. And uh, he likewise knows how to use the West's clot uh, against the West itself. Uh, and I think uh, while uh, the Russian president uh, Vladimir Putin has been making bold uh, moves uh, with the right motifs at the right moment. And Russia has been rapidly, actually rapidly returning uh, to global uh, power politics. The West has not been standing idly by. It has been uh, relentlessly trying to contain Russia and if necessary, reduce its growing rule in, uh, in international uh, affairs. So uh, to me, the most striking thing, uh, I mean, uh, 
that how Russia is advancing, uh, how Putin is advancing Russia's national interests against those of its uh, rivals. Uh, and uh, I think he, uh, he knows how to plan and he always plans and thinks ahead and then makes the right move uh, that brings him, uh, brings him success. Uh, Western leaders, in my opinion, just uh, cannot understand how Mr. Putin has thus far managed to keep Russia ahead in the geopolitical, uh, in the geopolitical game. And uh, all attempts uh, by the United States and the European Union in recent years, I mean, uh, obsess it with a weakening Russia at all costs to isolate and sanction Moscow, in my opinion, have so far provi proved uh, fatal. Uh, I think uh, the containment strategy uh, about which I already talked in my presentation has had a reverse effect. It has only fueled anti-Western sentiment, not only in Russia, I would say also in, uh, in the entire post-Soviet uh, territory, deepened considerable strains in the EU-Russia relations and uh, raised uh, the risk of an unintended flare-up with the United States. With regard to, uh, to your uh, other questions, uh, well, yes, uh, I believe uh, competing regionalism uh, can indeed be transformed into cooperative regionalism. Because uh, through economic, or if you want, geoeconomic projects that could be launched uh, by Russia, China, and EU, uh, the triangle itself, I mean, the EU-Russia-China triangle may definitely benefit from, uh, from these regional integration projects. Of course, uh, and I'm sure that it's possible, it's possible to find a common ground. Uh, and it's not, it's, it's not only because of, uh, because of national interests, uh, these great powers are pursuing, uh, but it's also because of uh, because of uh, beneficial uh, side of uh, cooperation. I mean, all of them uh, may benefit uh, and benefit a lot from these investment projects like uh, Germany and other European countries benefit from uh, Nord Stream, uh, Nord Stream, for example, and uh, other uh, economic, global economic projects. Uh, I think there is a lot uh, to discuss. Uh, I mean, uh, to discuss uh, a lot uh, a lot of space uh, for discussion uh, and uh, for dialogue between Russia and the EU in particular, and between Russia and the West in general. Uh, and it's not only about connectivity or inf or more precisely infrastructure connectivity or infrastructure projects there are several other uh, global issues like terrorism uh, climate change uh, these are important uh, i would say very important uh, questions that 
these three powers, I mean, US, Russia, and EU, uh, well, along with China uh, as well, uh, to look into uh, and uh, to discuss it uh, thoroughly and uh, bring a solution on the table, at least how to deal with these global issues in the coming years. Mm, otherwise, uh, all of them, I mean, Russia, uh, China, EU and the United States only lose. Nobody will be a winner, uh, nobody. Uh, and I strongly believe uh, the leaders of these uh, great powers understand very well uh, the nature of uh, these problems. And uh, they, they know how to, at least how to proceed on the matter. Probably they, they don't know a uh, solution, but I'm sure they could reach a progress in solving these uh, problems. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we have a question, which is a very important question, I think. Uh, I will just uh, read it. Uh, so, in which condition EU can be really uh, one of the pillars uh, in this world independently? Uh, so, uh, this is uh, a question uh, we have in Q&A. Um, and this is important because a lot of uh, experts talking about, especially from China and Russia, talking about the uh, uh, European Union is not independent and uh, in reality can't uh, achieve uh, the geopolitical goals uh, on its own. Well, uh, should we should I answer this question, or we collect all of these questions, or I could answer separately? I think uh, we can start with this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, the European Union, as international uh, actor and uh, important international organization, I would say, is not independent. And I think uh, true experts know very well why. I mean, the reasons uh, of dependence, uh, the European Union's dependence uh, on, uh, I would say, the United States and NATO uh, because of geopolitical issues and possibly also uh, due to geoeconomic, uh, geoeconomic. Uh, uh, problems. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the European Union should self-position itself, especially in the post-COVID-19 uh, era. And it's possible uh, if we uh, look at the uh, political agenda uh, EU's political agenda, and especially with a change of power in Germany, uh, new leaders coming and probably will be coming in the, uh, in the next few years. Uh, I believe uh, EU needs a new strategic vision on how to deal with European security. This is very essential. Uh, point and uh, I believe the European Union should 
uh, tackle on this uh, issue. But uh, the European Union should understand, understand clearly that security in Europe without Russia is not possible. And it's not because of because Russia is part of Europe or Russia plays greater rule and so forth. No, because Russia is great power and great European power and may contribute from my point of view significantly to resolving many security issues still un uh, unresolved, uh, that still remain unresolved in, uh, in terms of uh, European, uh, European uh, security. So uh, self-positioning, uh, new strategic vision, uh, new innovative approach, innovative, I want to emphasize approach to uh, many regional security issues, active participation in uh, Eastern partnership uh, program, and not just uh, supporting Eastern partner partners uh, and uh, providing financial aid. I think European Union should talk directly with the Eastern partner countries. For now, European Union is not a security actor in the Eastern Partnership region. Many in the post-Soviet space raise an interesting yet sensitive question, why we need Eastern Partnership if the European Union does not want to be an active player in conflict resolution and peace building. I wanted to emphasize active or even proactive, proactive player. It's not sufficient to have missions in Georgia or Moldova or somewhere in the Eastern part. It should be proactive policy, EU policy towards Eastern partnership uh, countries. Uh, both in terms of politics and uh, security, not to mention economics, where European Union is, uh, I mean, uh, trying to do, trying at least to do best. So, uh, Germany, of course, is a leading power in the EU, uh, but uh, and everything on e Germany's shoulder now. Uh, what will happen next after uh, Olaf Scholz uh, coming to power? Nobody knows, but I think uh, Germany will continue uh, to play a leading role uh, and uh, try to contribute uh, to uh, maintaining stability in uh, at least in the EU zone. But uh, it's precisely Germany that uh, could initiate new political uh, approach or develop a new innovative approach uh, towards uh, its Eastern uh, neighborhood. Why? Because for many years, there was Eastern a neighborhood program in the Germany's foreign ministry. Uh, I'm familiar with this, but this Eastern policy, I mean, Germany's Eastern policy uh, with a desire to transform it in the, uh, in, in the context of EU policy has so far failed. And uh, it's not because of Russia. Uh, I met with high-ranking officials in Berlin, and many blame Russia. I mean, for uh, blame Russia for for the lack of uh, uh, EU's uh, 
political or geopolitical activity in the Eastern Partnership. That's not true. If you want to challenge Russia, go ahead. The problem, are you ready to challenge? Are you prepared to challenge? And how will you, how you, will, going, uh, how you will be going to challenge Russia? Do you have a policy? Do you have a strategy? No. Then go ahead and restart a constructive dialogue with Russia. Talk, discuss beneficial economic and investment projects. I would never, uh, I, I never heard Russians, uh, Russian officials say or blame or call uh, the EU or Western, uh, Western uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, I mean, if you, if you review uh, Mr. Putin's statements, he always call Westerners as uh, partners. But I have uh, heard a lot in the US and generally in the Western circles, the word of enemy or Russians th threat. Uh, I try, I just try to, un uh, to understand why the Western countries so much de demonizing uh, Russia. Is it in West's interest to do so? I don't think so. Uh, so, uh, as I as mentioned in my presentation, without uh, dialogue and re and a constructive relationship between Russia and West in general, and between uh, Russia and EU in particular, uh, it would be it would it would be impossible to reach any solution or uh, rebuild Europe in terms of, first of all, in terms of uh, security. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my own research uh, showed that China and Russia uh, dialogue is uh, strong enough and sufficient enough uh, and coordination between uh, Eurasian uh, Economic Union and BRI uh, is sufficient enough. Uh, uh, and uh, at the same time, you mentioned that uh, you can uh, see uh, or foresee uh, some potential conflicts uh, between the two countries in the future. So can you elaborate on that? Uh, what type of uh, conflict uh, possibilities uh, can be, emerge uh, from this cooperation. Yes, it, it, I said it could be. Uh, probably uh, it could happen if uh, China becomes more powerful uh, and uh, decides to challenge Russia. But I, I personally don't believe in it because uh, Russia and China, I mean, traditionally have always, and historically, I mean, uh, have always tried to find a common ground. Um, because of uh, strategic interests in in on the global uh, arena first of all it also depends on uh, leadership i think we don't know what will happen in 20 or 25 20, 30 years how will russia or china look in the mid middle of 21st century, for example. Uh, 
but I think it's about uh, it's about future, and uh, it's it's too early to to talk about that because it's about scenarios and uh, scenario planning actually, and it takes uh, more comprehensive research to do with regard to Russia-China relations uh, in the in the 21st century. For now, I think uh, Russia and China are trying to enhance their strategic partnership. And Russia is very much interested in involving uh, China into a Eurasian Economic Union. And uh, considering that Mr. Putin and Xi are good friends, uh, I don't expect them to have any problem or, or just rivalry uh, that may happen between two countries. There is a convergence of uh, interests, even in Central Asia, even in Central Asia, despite so active rule China playing now in Kazakhstan, for example, Uzbekistan and some other countries. Uh, but I think, uh, I would say even, I'm, I'm confident that China under C uh, has accepted Russia's realpolitik in post-Soviet space. And uh, that's sufficient to to the Kremlin to deal with Russia, to deal with China, and to enhance cooperation in many fields. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we are out of time. Uh, thanks to Ehan Nuriev, our speaker, uh, to our colleague Viktor Esterhoy and to all our guests for this interesting uh, discussion. Uh, please be a part of our events and discussions uh, in the future as well. Uh, stay up to date with our social media and web page. Um, uh, see you all next time. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Georgi, and uh, thank you, Victor, for, for your uh, contributions. I really enjoy it and uh, hope to meet you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Let's continue your discussion. Bye-bye. <laughs>